Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. We want to start right on time because we're uh, webcasting and we don't want those folks uh, online to, uh, to just see a blank screen. So uh, my name is Kevin Gover. I'm the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, we want to welcome you to our symposium on racist stereotypes and cultural appropriation in American sports. Uh, we also want to extend a warm welcome to our virtual audience watching the webcast. Now in this program, we explore the mythology and psychology of sports stereotypes and mascots. And that reminds me, if you would be so kind, uh, mute your phones, um, and uh, because we, we are online. Uh, we examine the retirement of Native American sports references and the efforts to revive them. And we conclude with a spirited community conversation about the name and logo of the Washington DC professional football team. I would also like to invite all of you to continue the conversation and enjoy some refreshments at a reception in our Potomac Atrium immediately following the symposium. Now, most of our visitors, whether native or non-native, come to our museum carrying information, misinformation, ideas, attitudes, and prejudices, both negative and positive, based in what they have learned about American Indians in the course of their lives. Now, only a very few of us have devoted extensive study to Native history, art, and culture, so most people's understandings are formed based on the limited information they receive primarily from two sources, the formal education system in the United States and the popular media culture in the United States. Now, my own experience in contending with the information I was given while growing up as an Indian kid in Oklahoma is instructive, I think. Native history and culture was only rarely touched upon while I was in elementary school and junior high. I had more than the usual interest in these subjects, but I can recall only the occasional reference to American Indians, almost always accompanied by a photo of Indian people standing on a rocky hillside dressed in feathers and buckskin. I learned nothing about the history of Native people prior to contact with Europeans, save the few pages in my Oklahoma history book dedicated to the Spiral Mounds, which was an archaeological site in eastern Oklahoma. It was as though what pre-existed Columbus' arrival in the America was uninteresting and unimportant. Meanwhile, at the movies and on television, the Westerns were thriving. Even while knowing these stories were fictional, they wore on me. The Indians were semi-naked, monosyllabic, and fierce, quite unlike the many Indians I knew as family and friends. The white people, on the other hand, were smart, industrious, and only reluctant users of violence. The racial message was consistent and powerful. Indians were stupid and violent, though oddly noble in their savagery, and white people were civilized, principled, and heroic. And this brings us to sports stereotypes and Indian mascots. I noticed at a young age that professional football teams in Washington and Kansas City and professional baseball teams in Cleveland and Atlanta used Indian references as their nicknames and images of spears, war clubs, arrowheads, and the like on their uniforms. They used, in some cases, caricatured or stereotyped images of Indian people on their helmets and jerseys. Atlanta even had an Indian mascot who would emerge from his teepee to celebrate in dance each home run by the team. This struck me as strange because I noted that no other existing racial group qualified for this role and that none of the athletes on these teams were actually Indians. I also noted the widespread use of native images and references, including mascots, as college sports symbols. Indeed, the University of Oklahoma had its own Indian mascot, Little Red. I spent my junior high years in Norman and, of course, was a fan of the university sports teams. When the football team scored a touchdown, Little Red would Indian dance exuberantly for the cheering crowd. To its credit, the University of Oklahoma long ago abandoned the Little Red mascot. Taken together, the messages my generation received from our formal education and the popular culture were clear. Indians were interesting only in terms of their engagement with non-Indians. A good Indian was one who assisted white people in establishing civilization in the American wilderness. Native women were especially likely to see the virtues of white civilizers and assist them in their efforts. Native men, being violent and dim, resisted civilization ferociously but futilely. Above all, perhaps, contemporary Indians were not relevant. 
Indians were figures of the past. It would be entirely fair for a non-Indian student in, say, Ohio to conclude that Indians simply cease to exist. This is a powerful set of ideas being delivered over and over. They made growing up as an Indian child harder than it had to be. As an older student and as an adult, I made a point of learning more about Native history and culture and came to understand the enormity of the omissions and misrepresentations about Native people that continue too often unchallenged in the educational system and culture of the United States. Now, some things have changed. Certainly, the mythological heroism of Columbus has been challenged in both popular culture and modern scholarship. Most people acknowledge the absurdity of Columbus discovering a world that had been occupied for millennia. On the other hand, certain myths persist and are reinforced. Disney's animated Pocahontas celebrates the Indian princess helping white people bring civilization story of old. Even the movies in which Indians are heroes too often engage in the old stereotypes. The large blue Indians of Avatar and the Indian werewolves of the popular Twilight series may be heroes, but note the spectacular violence of which they are capable. Note as well the addition of new stereotypes that evolved in the late 20th century. Indians as pristine envir environmentalist and even better, magic Indians. These characters portray Indians of the past. Television, movies, books almost never portray Indians as contemporary characters. We are confined to the past as though the government's policies directed toward the deconstruction of native nations had succeeded universally. The practice of using native people as mascots largely emerged at the very time government policy was to deliberately destroy native language, native religion, and native identity. In this respect, the mascots served very directly the government's purpose by portraying Indians as proud and noble figures, but only figures of the past. Government policy in the popular culture assumed that, certainly by the end of the 20th century, there would be no more Indians. These policies find their roots in the misguided beliefs of the 19th century in racial hierarchy and the ranking of cultures from primitive to civilized. It hardly bears noting that the so-called science of race in the 19th century always concluded that white people, Anglo-Saxon or Nordic white people in particular, were the pinnacle of human development and their civilizations were the best ever achieved. Now this foolishness has long since been discredited as simple racism, as have the policy ideas that arose from it. The popular culture, however, has kept alive the vanishing red man stereotype that is at the foundation of the phenomenon of native mascots. The celebrations of our extinction turned out, of course, to have been premature. However, certain ideas and themes in the popular culture remain persistent and influential. Native mascots are primary offenders in perpetuating these stereotypes. We are told they are meant to honor Native American qualities, such as bravery, strength, physical, of course, not mental, endurance and pride. Certainly Native people have, have and had those qualities in varying degrees, though I see no reason to believe they had or have them in greater, greater quantity than other people's. And why is it that Native people are not chosen to represent positive human qualities such as intelligence, piety, generosity, and love of family? I suppose the answer is that we are far less interesting to mascot makers when revealed to be ordinary human beings with all the virtues and failures of other human beings. <coughs> now, I've just given you sort of a, uh, uh, an intellectual uh, approach to this issue, but in fact, my opinion about this issue was formed a very long time ago when I was about 15 years old. And um, when it comes to this issue, as, as is true of many others, I am very much my mother's son. And when I was 14 or 15 years old, uh, as I said, I lived in Norman, Oklahoma. And my mother, Maggie Gover, uh, who was a white woman, happened to work at that time for the president of the University of Oklahoma, uh, Herbert Holloman. Um, and at that same time, Indian students at the University of Oklahoma were challenging this mascot, Little Red, that danced at the football games. I remember my mother writing a letter uh, to Dr. Holloman, her boss, 
describing what it was like uh, to be an Indian at that time in Oklahoma, where uh, aggressive and open racism against Indians was not the norm, but it was not unusual either. And I was sort of stunned, because I knew my mother was white and I knew my father was Indian, uh, but I was stunned to see how well she understood the challenges that Indian people faced. And I realized how hard it must have been for her trying to raise three little brown kids uh, in that environment. And uh, in that letter, she spoke uh, passionately and persuasively to her boss, Dr. Holloman, uh, asking him to do away with the little red mascot. Now, I don't know if that's why Dr. Holloman did it. I'm sure he had a complex of reasons. But in fact, the little red mascot was done away with. And, uh, and I found that story uh, not only important to my development as a child, but uh, certainly inspiring as we continue to, uh, to fight these battles over the use of Native American people as mascots. So here at the National Museum of the American Indian, we relish the opportunity to challenge these and other stereotypes. I would like to thank our outstanding panelists for coming here today to advance this conversation. In particular, in particular the distinguished panel moderators, uh, Dr. Manley Begay, Dr. Suzanne Schoen Harjo, and Dr. Philip Deloria. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Manley Begay, who will moderate the first panel of the day, Mascot Origin Myths. Dr. Begay is Associate Social Scientist Senior Lecturer in the American Indian Studies Program at the University of Arizona and co-director of the Harvard Project on American e Indian Economic Development at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He is also a man who has thought deeply and taught influentially on the topic we address today. Please help me welcome Manley Begay. Good morning. It certainly is a beautiful day. I'm so happy to, to serve uh, actually two roles. Uh, one as a moderator for this particular panel. And I've also uh, been asked to uh, give a, a blessing to open up this particular event. I'm a Navajo, uh, originally from uh, Tuba City and wheat fields, and it's um, actually my pleasure to, to give a, a prayer this morning. And I ask you to join me uh, in, in this prayer. Uh, as a Navajo person, um, we usually pray no less than two hours. <laughs> uh, and you, you can remain seated. And I will not be praying in the mic, uh, so... Uh, um, and I welcome also those that are on air as well. Thank you. Mascot origin myths um, is, a, is a really interesting topic. And we have with us uh, a uh, distinguished uh, panelist. And uh, this particular subject matter is a, is a very serious matter. When I was a graduate student at the 
at Harvard University, I received a call from a, a teacher from uh, uh, Quincy Public Schools in, in Quincy, Massachusetts. And uh, he m mentioned that, um, that there was a mascot that they've been trying to change for <coughs> uh, quite some time. But it was very, very difficult for the community and the students and the faculty and also administrators to, to support uh, this change that needed to occur. And interestingly enough, uh, you see this mascot here uh, uh, on the screen. And <coughs> uh, the story behind this is, is rather bizarre, uh, uh, laughable at times, uh, but very, very serious. Uh, there were two native kids uh, at the school, and uh, the kids clearly were uh, offended by this particular uh, emblem. So I was asked to go speak to the school board and, and also community members, and so I went and spoke to the, to the board and also spoke to the uh, community members. And, and I asked, I said, um, I, you know, I went through the, the, the typical arguments about why uh, this is offensive. And <clears throat> I was continuously reminded that uh, this is not a native image. And I said, uh, really? And they said, no, this is not native. Uh, it's not an Indian person. I said, it sure looks like it. Uh, two feathers, uh, a headband, uh, a tomahawk, uh, breech cloth, moccasins. And uh, they said, no. I said, well, what is it? And I was informed that, uh, well, Mr. Yaku, as his name, is um, a depiction of an Armenian dentist. I said, well, uh, I don't see a drill. I don't see uh, a mask, um, and, and they said, yeah, it's an Armenian dentist uh, after uh, Dr. Jacobian. I said, okay. I said, well, this is the origin of this particular mascot. Apparently, Dr. Jacobian, uh, a, a generous benefactor to Quincy Schools, was honored. So his facial feature was put on this emblem and it became Mr. Yaku. Mr. Yaku was born. And to this day, North Quincy High School, the Red Raiders, they still have this emblem. And I could not convince for the life of me, the people that I was addressing, that this is not a Armenian dentist. <laughs> but you can see that the entrenched feelings, the entrenched uh, uh, understanding of tradition is very, very difficult to change. Our panelists here today uh, are, uh, um, will address uh, mascot origin myths. Uh, to my left, uh, Dr. E. Newton Jackson is Associate prof uh, Provost and Professor of Sports Management, University of North Florida. Dr. Jackson actually hails from Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome home, Dr. Jackson. He's held various positions uh, in academia, like um, associate dean, department chair, program director for sports management programs, and faculty. Uh, he's worked at Howard University, Florida A&M University, Grambling University, and Florida State University. He has extensive NCAA coaching experience. He has also held the position of athletic director. He has written articles on the sociocultural aspects of sports to include racism in college sports, media relations in sports, and perpetuating the wrong image of Native Americans. To his left is Dr. C. Richard King. He's co-author of Team Spirits, Native Athletes in Sports and Society, and Encyclopedia of Native Americans in Sports, and professor and chair in the Department of Critical Gender and Race Studies at Washington State University. Dr. King has written extensively as well on native imagery in sports, and among his writings are sports in the media, borrowing power, racial metaphors, and pseudo-Indian mascots, on being a warrior, race, gender, and American imagery in sports, defensive dialogues, Native American mascots, and anti-Indianism and educational institutions. To his left is Dr. Ellen Storoski. She is currently professor in the Department of Sports Management 
Goodwin School of Professional Studies at Drexel University. She has served as graduate program chair, athletic director, men's soccer coach, let me repeat, men's soccer coach, dean of students, and, and a, a number of other positions. Among the places she's worked are Rutgers University, Oberlin College, Colby Sawyer College, William Smith College. She has expertise in social justice issues in sports, gender equity in sports, Title IX, athlete exploitation. She has research and written extensively <coughs> on the topic that we will discuss today. Her writings include American Indian Sports Imagery and Sport and Public Imagination, Title IX Literacy, What Coaches Don't Know and Need to Find Out, Hazing, and she's also written with Dr. King of Poles and Race Prejudice. To her left is Ms. Linda Wagner. She's author of Firelight, The Life of Angel Decora, Winnebago Artist, and Plain Indian, Dreaming Indian, The Trial of William Lone Star Dietz. She's a lecturer in the, in the Multicultural Studies at Sonoma State University. She's also a specialist in Great Lakes Métis History and Winnebago Culture and Genealogy. Her other writings include Posing Indian, Manifest Manners, and Subversion of William Lone Star Dietz. The Trial of Lone Star, which was actually cut from the original manuscript of Fire Firelight, and Reclaiming James One Star, and Neither White Man Nor Indians. We uh, will go with my left with Dr. Jackson first, who will uh, give uh, a short presentation and down the line, and then we'll have a panel discussion uh, about the topic, and then uh, we will open up uh, questions to, to the audience. And again, uh, welcome to this event. Thank you. Being a member of the Eastern Cherokee, Southern Iroquois, United Tribes of South Carolina, it's a privilege to join these colleagues and this uh, group today on such a timely topic. Timely in the sense that we've been discussing it for decades. Ironically, um, some institutions of higher education uh, got the message long ago as we heard Oklahoma, Stanford, Dartmouth, but a lot of institutions of higher ed have not, and K-12, have not quite yet accepted the dialogue that there are some issues with race and ethnicity. Anytime we talk about race and ethnicity, there is such an uncomfortable cloud in the room. It doesn't matter if we're in the nation's capital, which yes, I grew up here and went to high school down the street at Gonzaga, but it, it's across the country, it's uncomfortable. It doesn't matter which ethnic groups we have in the room to talk about it. But discussion and, and dialogue is certainly the way to begin change. The problem that I've seen about the Native American mascot images historically is that it, the learned behavior, we don't always want to use the term racism, racist, because then it's defensive and we got to put up our, our shield. But we have to lay out certain facts. And the more we do that, the more we have the opportunity to hopefully allow our colleagues, our friends, and those that we don't know, an opportunity to see for themselves some of the disparities, and I would have to call them lies. I wanted to find a nice word I was gonna say on truths, but the lies, you know, I grew up learning Columbus sailed the ocean blue 1492. Well, you don't pull up to a place and people are waving and you discovered it. It just doesn't work that way. But that's how many of us in, in this nation uh, were educated. So it's hard to change some of these perceptions. I was gonna begin here with a discussion on symbols because that's somewhat where we go with images. It's about symbols, how we view things. And it's always the same. Is the glass half full or half empty? It depends upon the eye. It depends upon what we see. The same image, but has a different meaning, sadly. 
when we talk about sports and images, somehow this image comes up and, and denotes different things to different ethnic groups within the United States still today. In South Carolina, it became a um, debate over their capital, but it did not even rise above their capital to 1962. So is it really a tradition? We have a lot of different perceptions. And certainly my colleague to the left will discuss the Cleveland Indians, I'm sure, a little bit better than I will. But I think that the dialogue, when we look at calling people a name, Cleveland Africans, and this is just one of many uh, descriptions, uh, depictions that we've seen before. It used to be the, the Newark Negroes, the Jersey Jews. These are the ones that have been out there historically that I don't see anymore today, and I couldn't find it to show it to you, unfortunately. It only affects public opinion when it affects the individual. Unfortunately, the Native Americans seem to be the least powerful ethnic group in this nation today. Great discussion on immigration. I don't know about all the folks that didn't use that coming in initially from the Mayflower down, but you, you know, it's, it's a different perspective. I wanted to put this quote from Carol Oglesby, who's a white female, by the way, and a noted scholar. Um, she talks about where's the white and the rainbow coalition. And this was in a book from uh, Dana Brooks a few years back. And the irony is that for change to occur, it requires the dominant group to be supportive, encouraging, and participating. Civil rights here in this country, you know, we, we talk about the dreamer and, and Martin Luther King has a statue down the street if you haven't seen it. But for those that are not aware, the African Americans, blacks for that era, did not all agree with Martin Luther King. There were those that were like, don't rock the boat. It required white people to join in arms and walk, arms are like locked in arms, not arms, as in other types but to participate in the marches, in the boycott, in the protests, for change to occur. It requires the dominant group to buy in, which eventually gets the media support and exposure to others. And this is no different an issue. Coming from a sport management position, I see it a little differently about marketing. That's where images come from, the promotional attitude of of uh, mascots, whether it's the Cleveland Indians or the Florida State or um, the Fighting Sioux or any of these other groups that we've talked about, it's how they market it and how they promoted it. Well, I think you have to consider that it's about revenue today, not historically, but today, it's about revenue. And although there's a good debate about Florida State, where I was a faculty member for a number of years and had a great opportunity and loved it, the challenges about the Florida Seminoles supporting uh, Florida State University's push and, and symbolism is quite unique. Because I'm not aware that the institution gives them any of the revenue that they have from the apparel sales of all the Seminole distribution that they have. We're talking about, for a couple of years, they led the nation in athletic apparel sales. So there's millions of dollars. This is a sign that was um, down there for many years. Recently, they took the bridge out to have different urban planning going on and <coughs> reconstruct the traffic flow. But let's talk about traditions and myths. The Florida State Seminoles in the um, description of bringing Chief Osceola out on a horse they call Renegade and throwing the spear in the ground. And if you've watched ABC on TV, you've seen it, certainly. 
That didn't start till 1978. So how do you talk about historical? Where, where, where does that start? Once again, it's a promotional activity. But this sign here is not a promotional activity. Now, I can't say when it went up, but I can tell you it was there a good 15, 20 years. It's images. It's not only the language that says, but it's an image. How do we get to the other place where we understand one another a little better? That Native Americans are not a mascot, but it's the tough dialogue that must occur in the schools, among each other. I grew up in Washington and I love the national football team here. I don't call them by that name anymore. I, a number of decades ago, I participated with the Rainbow Coalition of Fairness and Sport Group, and we protested outside RFK Stadium. And I want to tell you, I was never so embarrassed and hurt that my fellow Washingtonians and Maryland and Virginia folks were so disgraceful, rude. The things they said to us, I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it whites, blacks, and Asians. Season ticket holders going in. I met with Jack Kent Cook and a, a group of other folks to try to convince him to change the name, that there was a revenue stream. I, ironically, his counterpart, Abe Poland, who owned the Washington Bullets, did, and they're now called the Washington Wizards. You could sell all your old apparel and have a whole new revenue stream and make more money. It's about money at the pro level. So I just couldn't understand why he couldn't get to it before he died. But I'm not gonna hold up because we're gonna have a lot of discussion later on. I, I did wanna share one last thought here about imagery. How does one person tell another that they honor them best? How do you do that? When I'm telling you that what you're saying and doing does not honor me. Keep in mind, you will hear the debate that, oh, well, not all Native Americans um, agree. Some Native Americans think that this is, that it's okay to have mascots in, in such a stereotypical format. African Americans don't agree on the word N-I-G-G, -G, whatever. There are some that think it's a despicable word from generations. And there are those that use it with term of affection and endearment today. Within groups, we're not gonna all agree. The issue is that some are offended. That's the issue. We don't agree in anything. 400 yards from now, there's a bunch of folks that we put up in that big building, and I guarantee you, they don't agree on anything. Thank you. sure I stay on time here. <laughs> Sorry, I have a feeling I could talk for too long on this today. Um, first I want to say uh, great, great thanks to uh, the National Museum of the American Indian for bringing us here to have this event today. Um, it's a great honor to be here and I'd like to express gratitude to um, the activists from Carlos Montezuma through um, Charlene Teeters, to many people we don't know who have raised this issue and have brought it um, both to the consciousness of scholars and to um, everyday conversations in the newspaper and on the street. Um, and I should say that I come to this, um, this project as an alum of the University of Illinois. Um, and really for a great deal of my life I grew up, didn't think much about mascots. Um, I grew up in Kansas City. I was a a fan of the, of the professional football team there. My high school played a team called the Indians. I swam in this water um, and really didn't take much or give much thought um, to what mascots might have meant. Um, it was really only when I was at Illinois that I began to think about mascots and really come face to face with the anti-Indian racism that they embody. And I was quite hopeful in 2005 when the NCAA banned mascots in intercollegiate athletics that, hey, perhaps we've turned a corner, perhaps some kind of progress 
has been made, we're on a new page. Um, and I'm here today to tell you we really haven't turned a corner, and the football team in uh, our nation's capital might be one point of evidence of that, but I'd like to point to a more local and perhaps um, less known set of practices, which is the efforts to revive the Chief of Line at WIC at the University of Illinois. Um, there have been efforts by student groups and alumni groups to have alternative homecomings, to bring the chief back to homecoming parades, and as the t-shirt on the screen indicates, to um, offer up, I guess, what they would call playful um, uh, re revivals of the chief. Um, and if you can't read it, the t-shirt says, <clears throat> Excuse me, the, 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 this is the unofficial St. Patrick's 2010 shirt. It has Chief Alinewick on, on the front. He's got two beer bongs, which reinforces all kinds of negative stereotypes about Native Americans and I would say college students. And on the back it says um, that, that Chief Alinewick, the mascot's far from dead. He's just passed the F out. Right. So far from us turning a corner, um, I would say that we really are living in a kind of afterlife. And I, I'm interested really in the afterlife these days of mascots, right? Those, those arguments to revive, to defend, um, and to uh, make mascots meaningful still. Um, Chief Alinewick emerges in 26. He emerges um, out of Boy Scouts, out of Plain Indian, out of an acceptable tradition of taking and remaking Indianness, and this is a picture of the chief dancing at halftime. I suppose they would have said at this moment in time the chief was about honor, bravery, respect, and reverence. While at the same time, um, you could go to a shop near campus and buy Chief Lineywick toilet paper, as well as Chief Lineywick on T-shirts. Right, so ultimately, um, Native American mascots. Um, turn as well on a particular kind of dehumanization and a desensitization of the dominant population to that. Because the tradition that matters, the form of Indianness that matters, is that that they have made. It's a particular kind of possessiveness that really demands pr preservation and demands narratives and stories to protect it. And this is where I think and why I think origin stories matter so much. Origin stories don't matter really at the beginning because you're creating something. Origin stories begin to matter when people say, hey, that mascot is racist, that mascot hurts, that mascot is bad. And people look around and say, no, this mascot isn't bad. And they begin to create narratives, what I would call sincere fictions, to justify the mascot. They sincerely believe what they're saying, but what they're saying is fictional, Perhaps we like to say these things are untruths, lies, or myths. Um, and the reason that, um, I'm sorry, here's the toilet paper. I, I'm, I got a little ahead of myself there. Um, and here's a fan in, in DC um, who probably thinks very little about the origin stories that circulate um, when they're dressed in paint on the sidelines. Why it's possible and why it was possible to, to manufacture mascots, I would, I would argue, um, hinges on a particular kind of misrecognition on the one hand, right? A, 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 an expectation of what Indians are supposed to be like and a capacity to invent those uh, or make those, those, those images real, right? So much so that actual embodied Native Americans get lost, cannot be seen, and are not understood as equal human beings. Right. Um, it also hinges on a very material reality, right, and a consciousness that emerges out of that, right, a reality of dispossession, of displacement, and of death, right, and one in which a settler society emerges on the foundation of this and yet would like to forget it, right, as this image suggests, um, right, don't be self-conscious about playing Indian at your hipster party or at halftime. It's not like you've perpetuated any kind of real or symbolic violence against these people. Right? Um, and ultimately, even when we're being ironic, as Diesel is in this ad, right, we're always stupid 
when we think it's okay to play Indian and when we allow Indianness to be appropriated and perpetuated in this fashion. All right. Now, I would argue that, that this kind of misrecognition and material condition has bred a kind of entitlement in white Americans right, that um, remains largely unexamined. When we talk about origins, right, we are talking about white Americans and what they have done. We're not encouraging white Americans often enough to reflect on what it is that they have done or what kind of practices and consequences they're visiting upon the world. Right? We instead say, well, where'd that come from? Right? What, what, is, what is it about? And I would rather say, right, no, how does that story mean? Or how does it matter in the world? Right? Origin stories give their tellers a map of what the world is like. It tells them who they are. It tells them what is moral, what is good. Um, mascot stories in particular resolve contradictions. They allow for rather ugly images of Native Americans to persist and people to feel good about themselves creating them and enjoying them. Um, and ultimately, I think stories, origin stories, let people off the hook. If you can say, I'm honoring you, right? if you can say that, that what this is about is honor, if we can say, hey, the Cleveland Indians, that's all about honor. That's, that's a kind of um, reverence that we're exp expressing. Um, we like Indians, right? You've let yourself off the hook, right? And as, as Dr. Jackson has suggested, it's uncomfortable, it's hard to talk about race. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody wants to be called the racist. Well, if I'm honoring you, I can't be racist, right? And so I would argue that we need to spend and pay much more attention to the afterlife of mascots <laughs> And when they become questioned, um, right, because one, it tells us and shows us how untenable mascots are. It shows us how vacuous the fictions are. And ultimately, it tells us a lot about racial politics today, which I can say more about later, right? And I would encourage us to shift our focus from intention, what do people mean, why did they create that, um, and begin focusing more on impact, right? And focus, moreover, to support what Dr. Jackson said previously, on how we can engage these images, right? How we can engage whiteness, how we can deconstruct um, the histories we've told ourselves, and how we can come to terms of being a settler nation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm really um, so deeply appreciative of um, the opportunity to speak here um, and to have been invited um, by the National Museum of the American Indian to um, uh, contribute to this conversation about American Indian imagery as it's promoted in sport venues and the legacies that it um, draws from and passes on to future generations and why I think it's important that we come to grips with the dynamics that go on around these images. I, I would suggest that as a nation, we will never come to a place um, in our understanding about race until such time as we deal with this particular issue. I think that the stakes are this high for all of us. Um, I very much uh, appreciate what Dr. King is talking about um, in terms of this notion of an afterlife, um, especially because of the fact that when we get beyond the surface of the individual stories that we tell about um, these images. We can start with Cleveland, and I'm going to do that in just a minute. Um, one of the things that we begin to see very, very quickly is that they actually are all one and the same. Um, so that um, here we are sitting in Washington with um, uh, the use of the term redskins having been disputed for over 30 years um, and longer. 
Um, and, and somehow there's the experience that because this is quote unquote our image that it's somehow very special and just, you know, ours. Um, but of course, um, you know, that imagery was exported from Boston. Um, and, um, you know, um, there was the Boston Braves, and of course the Boston Braves, in terms of the baseball team, moved on to Milwaukee, which eventually became the Atlanta Braves. Um, and of course, in terms of the practices associated with both the Braves and the Tomahawk Chop, then we get something um, where we see it in Tallahassee. Um, so um, when we begin to look at that surface impression and then go deeper, we see that it's all one and the same. And I was particularly struck when I saw the image of the North Quincy um, uh, Ar 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 Armenian Indian, I guess. I, it's a little puzzling for me. Um, but, but was very struck, especially having spent a good deal of time looking at the image of Chief Wahoo that um, if you, and, and you can join me if you like, um, but you know, Wahoo Yaku, ya, Wahoo Yaku, um, there's such an interesting intersection there, and also, and how kind of had this image put up on the screen again. When you look at the Indians image here and remember um, the North Quincy image, they're almost identical. Um, so, so I think we really are up against this, um, um, uh, fabric of um, narratives that um, uh, that obscure um, the racial dynamics that are underneath them. Um, in 1992, Native American scholar and author Michael Doris wrote um, about these images that they serve as opaque curtains, solid walls of white noise, and in a classroom in Ithaca, New York, I ran smack dab into that curtain when my students engaged in a debate about the appropriateness of um, franchises using American Indian imagery um, during the quote unquote politically incorrect World Series which featured the Braves and the Indians. And one of the students, after I allowed this conversation to go on for quite a while, and I, I didn't have a position on it, um, I had grown up being a, uh, a Methacton warrior myself, had not reflected on these things at all. And um, a, a student in the back of the room raised his hand and he said, well, of course, the reason why the team is named for Lewis, or named the Indians is because of Lewis Francis Sock Alexis, so the, the first American Indian in professional baseball. And, and so he contested our discussion, saying, well, why are we talking about this? Um, this is such a uh, notable figure and such a, um, uh, a benign um, uh, uh, gesture. Why, why would we ever contest it? And you know, thus began this journey into um, unpacking the mythology associated with um, both the story, the way in which um, uh, a story was manipulated by the franchise to get us to believe what they wanted us to believe. And in the meantime, much of the history behind Lewis Francis Sock Alexis is also obscured. Um, for example, the franchise states that it, uh, its position is to honor Louis Francis Sock Alexis, but it neglects to share um, with those people who believe um, that um, the way in which Sock Alexis was characterized in the sports pages um, was, um, and uh, in, in one particular um, news account, um, uh, as a, a quote-unquote red skin, I think salient in terms of here, um, and within the context of um, needing to be subdued, um, similar to um, uh, the first scalp for Custer. Um, and, and these kinds of reminiscences circulate um, throughout um, the time that Louis Francis Sock Alexis is playing in the 1890s. Um, and, I'm reasonably sure that the fans of the Cleveland franchise um, are, are never educated about this particular history. 
And to me, this is the, this brings us back to why it's so important that we challenge these images. Because if, as an entire nation, if we know far more about our American Indian image mythologies than we do about white American Indian history, then these images are doing exactly what they're supposed to do, which is miseducate the entire populace so that we do not have to be accountable what, for what has gone on in the past. And we can also allow for um, uh, the continuing marginalization of um, American Indians as an entire group. Um, so I, I think that, um, that as we continue our conversation today, that there is much at stake for us to um, unlock this puzzle, um, to continue to challenge it, and um, ultimately to prevail. So I'll close with that, and, um, and then hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. Thank you. First, I want to thank um, the museum, the Native American, American Indian Museum, for inviting us. But I also want to put a special thanks to uh, Elizabeth Kennedy, um, no, I'm, um, Gish, right, uh, for taking care of all the arrangements, and especially for, uh, to my heroine, Suzanne Schoenharjo, for in putting this together. She's been amazing. Okay, I'm going to start with the past and kind of the beginning, near the beginning of this whole mess, really. Um, sports historian William J. Reischeck writes that in 1961, the Washington Football Club, owned by the reactionary George Preston Marshall, was the last in the NFL without, quote, a single black player on the roster, end quote. So that's 1961. In protest that year, the, the NAACP led a boycott against the team joined by Secretary of the Interior Stuart Udall, who nonetheless did not feel, quote, he had sufficient legal standing to bar the team from its stadium, end quote. Obviously, this story is significant to our discussion, but what caught my attention was Rychek's observation. Quote, ironically, Marshall had been a racial pioneer of sorts, hiring a full-blooded Native American Will Lone Star Deeds as coach of his Boston Braves in 1933. That's not pioneering, I thought. Native men had long been playing football. Pennsylvania's famous Carlisle Indian School team, who called themselves the Red Men, were wildly popular in the late 19th and earliest 20th centuries. The team, whose best known coach was Pop Warner, began competing with Ivy League schools well before Jim Thorpe and his friend, Lone Star Dietz, joined the team. Carlisle closed in 1918, so Marshall hired the showman Dietz to replace Coach Lud Ray in the spring of 1933, hoping to cash in on Indian football nostalgia. As a nod to Carlisle, they, and I don't know which one, but both the uh, um, Marshall and Dietz created a new name for the Boston Braves, one already in the sports writer's lexicon. They dropped men and replaced it with skins. Today, Pro Football Inc. claims that this slick marketing ploy was to honor Lone Star Dietz. Newspapers of the day, however, did not mention Marshall's homage to his Native American coach. Instead, they listed Dietz's career accomplishments. Quote, Dietz assumed charge of the Redskins after a series of triumphs on the collegiate gridiron. He received his early football education under Glenn S. Pop Warner at Carlisle Institute and has coached successfully at Carlisle, Washington State, Mare Island Marines, Purdue, Louisiana Polytechnic, Wyoming University, Stanford, Los Angeles Town Club, and Haskell Institute. Dietz's tenure, end quote, Dietz's tenure at Haskell 
an Indian school in Kansas allowed him to recruit native players for Marshall, who were then directed to apply war paint to their faces while they played football. After complaints that the war paint clogged their pores and a disappointing second season, Marshall dumped his Indian coach, honored or not. Still, Lone Star Dietz has continued to play mascot for Washington Football Club. He was also inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame this year in May as a coach. And mascot comes closest to describing the nearly full-blooded, if not full-blooded, German. But he was a dramatic fellow who wanted to play football, and he wanted to play at Carlisle, where it was, as Sally Jenkins reminds us, the all-American spectacle sport. So he took on the identity of a missing Oglala man, or Sioux, born at Pine Ridge, named James One Star. He enrolled at Carlisle in 1907, probably illegally recruited by Pop Warner, and three months later, at 23, he married Carlisle's head of the art department, Angel Decora, a Ho-Chunk, or commonly uh, Winnebago woman, who was 14 years his senior. In June of 1919, Dietz, after Decora had died, and um, they had actually, he divorced Decora in uh, November of 1918 because he had gone on to Pullman to, te uh, to coach football and she did not follow him. So he divorced her in November. In February 1st, he was indicted. And on February 6th, she died. So I never knew, because uh, I wrote a biography about her, I never knew if she knew about his real identity. But in June of 1919, Dietz was on trial in Spokane, Washington for draft evasion. The federal government filed two counts against him, the first alleging, alleging that he falsely registered as a, quote, non-citizen Indian of the United States, end quote. The second charged he made, quote, false statements as to the fitness and liability of himself for military service, end quote, all while he was coaching the Mare Island Marines. The prosecution intended to prove Dietz was born of white parents at Rice Lake, Wisconsin, had not assumed the role of an Indian until he entered the Carlisle Indian School, although he had assumed the identity a couple years before, and that once he learned of the existence of one star, he began to impersonate him and assumed his name. So this is one star, James, the real James One Star's enrollment form or descriptive historical record from Carlisle Indian School where he went uh, in 1889 um, until 1892 and then in 1894 he enlisted in the army and served in, um, at Fort Vernon, barracks where Geronimo was. He was actually part of a troop hired, um, enlisted to ironically, guard Geronimo, and then he was dishonorably discharged from the army in 1894 and disappeared entirely. The year he disappeared, Dietz was 10 years old. An FBI v investigation begun in December of 1918 proved Dietz was posing. The prosecution proved Dietz was not James One Star. Um, that and uh, was not James One Star, who was the brother of a woman named Sally Eaglehorse, who at the time was 58 and was living on the Pine Ridge Reservation with her husband. And the Dietz began a had begun a correspondence with Sally in 1912 by representing himself as her brother. The judge instructed the jury to determine not what was true, however, but what they thought Dietz believed about himself. Thus, they did not reach a verdict and Dietz was re-indicted, he pleaded no contest, and was sent to jail for 30 days in January 1920. 
Often you will see uh, information about Dietz on the internet that's incorrect saying his identity was contested because people think that the jury was hung because he was or was not Indian, rather that they were hung because they couldn't determine whether or not he believed he was Indian. Infamy was better than neglect, however. As Dietz told one newspaper reporter in 1916, I'm like Lillian Russell. I don't care what they say about me as long as they say something. Eventually, his trial was forgotten, and though Dietz's relationship was with Sally was over, he continued to promote, and promote is a really good word, and it goes with what we were talking about before, his phony Sioux identity for the rest of his life. And in fact, his uh, headstone says he was born in South Dakota, and he was born in Wisconsin, and, and calls himself Lone Star. This is uh, the real James One Star, who is also pictured in um, a Carlisle Indian uh, Carlisle group of boys from Pine Ridge. Let's see. And the last, um, I just want to say. Uh, sorry, this is a. Uh, Dietz was an artist, and so he's painting. Uh, Lewis Weller, who of the of the Kansas team of I'm spacing out right now, the school. Say, Hass. Hass? <laughs> okay. Um, and what's interesting is that Lewis is wearing Dietz's outfit, and I'm going to call it an outfit rather than regalia because it's not really regalia. So he's uh, Lewis was one of the people he recruited to play for the Boston Braves, the Boston Redskins. Alan Trachtenberg of Yale University poses a question crucial to the Dietz case. Quote, how did it happen that dreaming Indian, playing Indian in fantasy and imagination, became a way of dreaming American, imagining oneself a member of the nation? End quote. Before the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act, the although native to a place called America, American Indians were not considered native to the nation, end quote. Of course, Trachtenberg builds on Philip Deloria's important work on how playing Indian seemed to relieve the burden of modernity. As Deloria explains, quote, primitives imagined as being in close contact with, with nature were thought to be able to mime the natural world more accurately than moderns, end quote. And Trachtenberg adds, by an ironic semantic twist, by the end of the 19th century, the same Euro-Americans who had once viewed American Indians as alien savages came to embrace them as the true, the natural, the first Americans, icons of the nation and its territory." End quote. As they both concur, playing and dreaming Indian fulfilled modern Americans' longing to go native. America's desire to go native arose in tandem with the notion that American Indians were headed to extinction. The vanishing Indian myth obfuscated the existence of still living American Indians, still suffering from the effects of America's devotion to its equally mythological manifest destiny. The Great Sioux War of 1876 to 77, which led to the Ghost Dance Movement and the devastating massacre at Wounded Knee on December 29, 1890, produced iconic first Americans, such as Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. The legacy of these warriors and their portrayal in mass media greatly influenced Dietz's generation. But as long as he plays Indian mascot, their spirits are terribly dishonored. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. We are going to have a, a discussion here uh, about the presentations uh, that just took place. And then uh, uh, a little while later, we will uh, have questions from the audience. There are microphones in the back that we'd like you to use if you have a question. <clears throat> and I'm just thinking, as um, as the panelists were, were talking, um, and the question that uh, Dr. King wrote, uh, raised about uh, 
we haven't turned a corner yet. Uh, you know, sparked a, a thought in my mind, <clears throat> and I'm wondering why. You know, why? Why is that the case? Uh, I have a colleague, uh, uh, Professor Freiberg, uh, Stephanie Freiberg at University of Arizona, who's done a lot of good work with her colleagues around the psychological effects of mascots on young American Indians. And uh, today, uh, the highest suicide rate uh, is uh, with young American Indians. And she's done work around the effects of mascots on self-esteem, uh, personal and community worth. And she's found that um, uh, the negative stereotype and imagery uh, has detrimental effect on young American Indians. And, and as we all know, the uh, suicide often occurs because of uh, a lack of positive self-esteem. And it's really quite interesting. Her work is, uh, is, is, is proof and evidence that, that um, mascots can be quite harmful. And I'm wondering, back to this question that Dr. King raises, you know, we haven't turned a corner yet, and I'm wondering why. So I'm going to throw this out to, to the panelists. <laughs> I, I, I guess since I raised the question, I have the obligation to, to try to answer it. Um, I, think I, I think I would point to two or three things. I mean, first I would say that I think in general, we, we as a nation or a society believe we've made a lot more progress on race and racism than we've actually made. I think that we've found new ways of talking about race while that allow us to perpetuate racism. So we no longer use ugly, overt stereotypes outside of the context of mascots, perhaps, yet social stratification is as bad or worse along the lines of race um, than it was 40 or 50 years ago, right? Which is a very disturbing um, pattern to note. So I think that one is this kind of disconnect between signs and structures and the kind of perhaps social work that they do for us. Um, the second, I think, has to do with the fact that this set of mythologies, as um, Ellen suggested, um, are so central to what it means to be American, what our nation means, um, and how we understand our past and future, that we've been unwilling or unable to really untie them and to begin to make sense of them. Um, and I would say that the primary reason that both of these other two features have persisted um, that underscores or undergirds all of this uh, has to do with, with white privilege and with whiteness and with the unwillingness or the inability of whites to really come to terms or begin to just ask very basic questions about their history, about race and power. Um, and the ease with which perhaps they've been able to flee many of these conversations, hide behind gated communities and hide behind origin myths. Um, I mean, those are, those are the three things that I would point to, none of which perhaps um, are pr particularly uh, suggestive of, of good, good ways out. Hello? Um, yeah, happy to take my shot, a, a swing at it, um, <laughs> since this is sports. Um, I, um, I, I, It occurs to me that um, these images are um, reinforced by um, institutional authorities and power. Um, they, they are encoded on schools. They're um, uh, embedded within uh, the educational system. Um, the, the media perpetuates them um, uh, in their coverage um, somewhat uncritically. Um, and so there, are, I, I think part of this um, dilemma of challenging them stems from the fact that we have these powerful institutional authorities that are um, giving um, full permission to engage in um, casual racism, um, to, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, literally um, um, uh, take from the American Indian community um, in 
grand tradition. Um, uh, you know, you take land and then you take, uh, you take culture. Um, and, and, but, but I think, you know, when we allow people to sort of talk about individual images without understanding that underlying piece, I think it becomes more difficult to interrupt them. The, the other thing that I, I think we do really have to think about, especially from an educational perspective, is what the educational imperatives are um, that we share as educators in interrupting the dynamics of what's going on. The notion that, um, oh goodness, I, I'll get in trouble for this, I'm sure, but um, the notion that we can have an image like um, the horse renegade riding out um, into a football arena, taking a spear, throwing that spear directly into the head of the honored, directly into the head of Chief Osceola every time, is something that, that, that must be challenged. It, it, it cannot go without comment and opposition. Um, and um, you can put whatever kind of window dressing you want on it, but it is as reprehensible of an act as anything that we will find in America. Um, and so I think for educators, they really have to rethink what they are allowing to go on um, as um, part of our fun and games. Dr. Jackson? I think there's been some, you have to look at the bright side, remember, you have to keep giving some positive reinforcement or else the dialogue dies quickly. And there has been change, of course, 19, what are we saying, 70 for Dartmouth and Stanford is a long time ago for some, but not so long for others. There have been institutions to make informed decisions. Of course, alumni and some supporters are not always pleased. I am more disturbed with Dr. King saying that those trying to, you know, I guess in the current state with vampire movies and everything, we're coming back from the dead. We're gonna bring, the, bring Illinois back again. Here, the fighting Illini are not giving up. That's horrible, that's horrible. So there is some progress, but we haven't gotten to where we need to be. But that says a lot about social justice as a whole. Hmm. Linda? Well, I, I believe that this comes back again to the question of being American and what is it to be American and how the shaping American identity has always been um, at least, say, since 1798, tied in with the identity or the, or the assumed identity of Native American people. Um, being American, in order, to, in order to separate from Britain, one of the things Americans did in literature and, and in other, um, beside, before sports even, is they identified themselves as Indian characters. They wrote books about Indian characters. They made up stories about Indian characters. And it's very deeply ingrained in our psyche, I think, um, even if you took it out of the sports realm, where it kind of, it, it went crazy, it's still in literature, um, it's still in Halloween costumes and Disney films, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like putting the mirror back on ourselves and saying, why is it that American identity is so intimately tied with a notion that we have this Native American side to ourselves, this primitive side to ourselves, why do we want to identify with that? That's, I guess, all I. Hmm. You know, when I gave a, a talk to the board of, to the board um, school board at North Quincy High School, there was a, a lady sitting next to me, and as I was standing there, uh, she grabbed my shirt like this, and she says, "Please don't take our yaku." You know, she was crying. <laughs> it was as though, if yaku was eliminated from North Quincy High School, she would cease to exist. <laughs> and I'm wondering, you know, we're talking about uh, mascot origins, and I'm wondering why, why is it that there's this entrenched feeling that uh, we have to hold on to these mascots, otherwise we cease to exist. And I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm, Dr. King? 
Well, I, I actually could, I would, if I had more time, I, I might have told a, a story today about um, my own grandmother who went to a high school that was the Indians. And when, after I got into this research, we had a long conversation in which she was crying about what the mascot meant to her and, and what it meant for me to be doing this work and wondering why it was everyone, uh, I think she used the word hated her. Why do they hate us so? Why do they want to you know, take this from us? And I, I think that this experiential effective element of, of mascots and of playing Indians explains one reason why people don't want to give them up. I mean, it's part of their identity, it's part of their life experience, it's part of how they know themselves, it's part of the, how they know their region. And to, it's not simply a sort of like, oh, well, let's just choose a new mascot. It's a whole set of other things that are entangled with who they are that they consciously or unconsciously will have to sacrifice and have to work through that I think underlies those kind of reactions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jackson? When we talk about the savagery, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's the tenacity and, and that, that's the emotion we want to uh, attribute to the mascots or the, those that are using them. When you bring up Chief Osceola, you know, for those, folks don't really know the history. Half black, never rode a horse. Um, <laughs> they were running, they were hiding in the Everglades. They didn't want to be relocated. And the irony is that when he made peace or attempted to make peace with the United States government, the army, they captured him under white truce captured him, and then beheaded him. And the uh, commanding officer kept the head to give to his child. Now, I'm trying to get, who's the savage? I, I just have a hard time understanding how we portray the historical facts. And then we distort it a little bit to try to make it, once again, a promotional and exciting thing with the flame and the spear and, you know, pomp and circumstance, fireworks. But what do we constantly pass on to the next generation? I'm glad to see that there are some young folks here today that'll have the opportunity to hear the descriptions. But it's certainly not what we see in Disney all the time and, um, or read. The images are wonderful and flowery. But America's not that way all the time, are we? Back here? Yeah. Just, just one second, uh, Ellen? Uh, you, you mentioned before um, the research um, by Stephanie Freiberg. Mm -hmm. And I think that that research does give us some insight into um, why we hold on to um, manufactured Indian identity the way that we do. Um, from the standpoint that um, her research reveals that for um, non-Indians, um, they receive a boost to their self-esteem. So while American Indian children may be suffering um, the consequences of a, a, a hit to their self-esteem, that um, whites um, actually experience a boost to it. And when we put that into the calculation of such strong, formative, experiences, playing cowboys and Indians, um, favorite Indian stories when we were children, um, you know, what happens to us in high school. Um, I, th I think um, to chip away at that and, and to fundamentally have people acknowledge that, that, that this is racist, to, to actually acknowledge that is something that it's a, a place where they do not want to go. And I do agree with Newton that we, that we have to figure out a way to, um, to, to get them to that space without shutting down conversation. Um, but, but, but it's a, a space where, where they just do not want to go. Linda? Uh, I'm thinking of what you said, Ellen, about it at bottom, it's one and the same. I think that um, just as a teacher, one of the things is to show students how these stories are completely interchangeable. Just get every single, you know, because I had, we had the Indians when I was in, uh, was that the high school was the Indians and 
junior high was the Warriors, and just show them when they, if they think this is some kind of special link that they have <laughs> to this, this, you know, mascot, that this is that's the only one ever. Part of it is that people are pretty insular about what they know about what's going on in the country, and I mean, I think just showing the reproduction of all of these images, one on top of the other, and how, and then side by side, perhaps showing the real history like you're talking about, I think it would dawn on people eventually that there's something funny about that, that really it isn't special, that there's something deeper that's going on here that has nothing to do with your special team. And I think in teams, you know, I'm, I'm almost thinking of the notion of the, of the clan, you know, that your mascot is your clan because you don't have a clan so you can identify with this mascot or this team. Um, I, I, I really think the more people know, the more they would let go of it. If you didn't just focus on your one region, you know. Great, thank you, we'll Dr. Begay. We'll I used we'll to take live a in. Question uh, from uh, the audience, yeah. Dr. Begay. I used to live in Page, Arizona, which is a major commercial center for the Navajo Nation. Work with many Diné people yeah. in the National Park Service. Now I'm in Montgomery County. Our local high school, Sherwood High School, are the Warriors, but so is the high school in your hometown of Tuba City, mm -hmm. uh, in the Navajo capital of uh, Window Rock. Their football team is the Fighting Scouts. Um, if people say we want to hold on to the Redskins, the Braves, the Indians, the Chiefs, the Golden State Warriors, is it then all right for, for Diné to hold on to the Fighting Scouts and the Warriors? Or is that uh, that's something that, that also should be given up? That, that's a very good question. <clears throat> and uh, here's my perspective and my thought. <clears throat> Native people, uh, have been colonized, colonized, colonized. And uh, we're, we're barely coming out of these, this colonized state in many respects. And mascots have take uh, uh, historical root. Many of these mascots, as the panelists have said, have had roots back into the 30s and the 20s. In particular, even the boarding schools uh, the boarding schools have, uh, you know, Indians, uh, Carlisle boarding school, and <clears throat> and many of these schools on uh, uh, on different reservations, including the Navajo Nation, uh, have adopted uh, these mascots from back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and often <clears throat> under some false pretense as well. And I think that um, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You, uh, you're toward uh, decolonization, and um, it is not appropriate, in my mind, to see this uh, occurring uh, at any school, whether it's native or non-native. So Dr. King talks a lot about, Dr. King is talking a lot about whiteness, about white guilt. Uh, I would ask Dr. Jackson, what about African-American fans of the Redskins, of whom there are hundreds of thousands? What does that, what does that mascot represent, do you think, to African-Americans in Washington? I think the same thing to the misinformed white folks. Um, as I indicated before, when I protested RFK years ago, uh, there were African-Americans that were just as rude and um, vile as the counterparts. Education is the key, but it's a reinforced <laughs> education, and, and I think the, the comment that Linda made a minute ago of that we have to keep putting everything out there for them on both sides of, of the uh, screen so everyone can understand better what they don't really understand. We're caught up in a, in a, in a love of a sport mm -hmm. and a team, team loyalty, brand loyalty, whatever you want to call it in the marketing world, but the reality is there's some sidebar impacts that individuals don't understand. Thank you. They don't care. Okay. Another question? It's a tough, it's, it's, it's a tough audience, Dr. Begay. Um, I'd like to address this question to you. <clears throat> like Dr. Jackson, beginning in 1992, which was the last great season of the Washington football team, and also the 500th anniversary of uh, Columbus's um, pl uh, beginning of the plunder, Native American groups began picketing every single game at RFK Stadium. I attended every one of those home games and witnessed, as Dr. Jackson said, the abuse that was heaped upon 
the native uh, demonstrators. <clears throat> I was a reporter. Uh, and um, at that same time, Susan Schoen Harjo and others launched a lawsuit before the Patent and Trademark Board, which was eventually successful in outlawing the racist name, which was eventually overturned. Um, uh, but as Dr. Jackson points out when he mentioned, so I'm, I'm familiar with this history and have written about it often and, and totally embraced the, um, the uh, rejection of the racist name. We wouldn't call them the Coons, you wouldn't call them the Jigaboos, and so why should we call them uh, the Redskins? <clears throat> but, or niggas. <clears throat> or niggas. Or niggas. But Dr. Begay, I'd like to ask this question, uh, which when Dr. Jackson pointed out the history of Osceola as half African, um, just in 2012, there was a massive disenfranchisement. When I mentioned this point to my colleagues and friends, they say, well, why are you expecting black people to support this, this native cause when in 2012 there was a massive disenfranchisement, a vote by, I think it was the Sioux Nation, to disenfranchise the black Indians and say, you're no longer Indians. Cherokee. So, the Cherokee, thank you. Um, but, so how do you justify recruiting the support of African Americans like myself, or how do I defend support for this cause when uh, African Americans say, well, they disenfranchised us uh, lock, stock, and barrel after hundreds of years, after you know, decades of being the thought of thinking themselves as Indians. How do you correct that uh, imbalance? Wow. <laughs> Any Cherokees out there? <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I want to throw it to you. Uh, well, uh, this is the way I, 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 would, I would answer that question. It's actually a very good question. Uh, Native nations <clears throat> in its entirety uh, exists on uh, the fundamental principle that we're sovereign entities. Uh, we're sovereign. We're sovereign nations. Uh, uh, Politically, it's uh, embedded, deeply embedded in the Constitution of the United States, uh, which specifically recognizes at least three sovereigns, uh, the federal government, state governments, and Indian nations. And each nation <clears throat> has their right to determine who should be a citizen and who should not. And each nation within its boundaries determines how they should run their affairs. It's a... Uh, it would, it would not be appropriate for me to comment on what is going on in Cherokee Nation in terms of their sovereign status. Uh, I have an opinion. It might not necessarily be uh, what Cherokee people would like to hear, but really what's happening at the Cherokee Nation is up to the Cherokee people, including those that have been disenfranchised and there are, we live under the rule of law, we live under these circumstances, and that's something that will need to be addressed through the institutions that have been set up at the Cherokee Nation. It has not been resolved yet. It has not been resolved yet. So we're gonna see how this gets played out. So it's very, very interesting. The, the other question that, that sort of was embedded in, 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 the, in the larger uh, statement is, uh, is around why should we support one another? Um, it's really quite interesting. Uh, we're, we're in this together. That's right. uh, we're a human family. That's right. uh, we are who we are, five-finger people. And, and <clears throat> the United States is based on a set of laws and rules and regulations, in particular, democracy, justice, and so forth. I was one of the seven litigants with Suzanne so Schoen Harjo uh, to, uh, against the Pro Football Inc. And we went through 17 years of this fight. Uh, we, we did not lose on a technicality. We were paused on, te on, the, on a technicality. <laughs> There's a younger group coming up where latches will not be attached to them. And let's see if the United States 
is up for justice. Let's see. Let's see what these younger folks will achieve. So I'm looking forward to that day. <clears throat> and it also reminds me that um, as a young man, um, I would go into, I went into, I would go to a store, I would walk down the street, in particular um, uh, in the border towns. Wouldn't you know it? I would be called uh, a dirty redskin, a stinking red nigger, and it still is with me. You know, those words. It's very, very hurt, hurt, hurtful. And when, when hurtful comments are made like that, and you hear and see on, in sports entertainment those words being celebrated as though it's the next best thing since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you question the intent of these people. And sports entertainment, as Dr. Jackson was saying, it's really about money. It's really about money. <coughs> so if you hit them where it hurts, I think mm -hmm. change can occur. And I'm looking forward to that day when the younger folks uh, that are bringing up the case uh, uh, comes before court. Uh, I think uh, it'll be a good day. It, it uh, answers to the questions that were posed. Another question, please. Yes, good morning. My name is Asantua Nkrumah Ture. And like some of the previous speakers said, I too used to be at the old RFK Stadium protesting with my Native American brothers and sisters regarding the racist name of the Washington football team. And I share some of their same concerns because fast forward from then to now, I find myself cringing about how some of my own people, people of African descent, gauge in stereotypes not only against Native Americans, but against Palestinians, Latinos, only some of whom are immigrants, uh, et cetera. So I'm wondering from the panel, just how far along are we on a broad multiracial understanding of the seriousness of this issue? And I, I, let me just share a quick personal story. Many African people in this country also have Native Americans in our family trees. So for me to struggle with another person of African descent about this issue makes no sense to me. You know, I go up their family tree, I see their great grandmother and their great grandfather are Native American. My great grandparents were Native American. So why, among people of African descent, are we also having this kind of discussion? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Panelists? Bad behavior is bad behavior. I mean, there's just no way to cut around it. It's learned behavior is, is where we've gotten all of the stereotypes historically and for all groups. And social justice is trying to make a change. And of course, down the street, as I said before, the Capitol, we have some that don't want to change and some that do. I mean, I mean we have to understand that we have people that live two lives. Uh, I saw that Strong Thurman's black daughter died in the Washington Post the other day. Uh, you know, he didn't admit that forever. I mean, if you know your history, you know the type of people we're talking about that we elect and allow us to uh, lead us. But we should not have divisiveness among any groups. Uh, strength is in power, it's about understanding, it's about education, and we're gonna always have a dissenting person or group of people that disagree within every ethnic group about every topic. But we have to have the dialogue. We have to continue to not shout, not point fingers, not use the derogatory terms. We have to have better efforts at educating one another. And, and if, I, if I could just add, I think that <clears throat> it's important to recognize that race is not just an axis of identity. It's long been an axis of division and a means of exclusion. Um, and if we think about some of the, the core messages that are, the panel are communicating, uh, social citizenship and political citizenship in the United States often have linked whiteness and citizenship. And I think that until we can decouple those and we can encourage some kind of something beyond essentialized racial identities and coalitions, um, I, I worry about 
getting to that place where we say, where's the white in the rainbow coalition? Um, and I would say that it's really this, this in some ways, this, this issue of white supremacy um, that, that's, that's driving that. But that, that's, that would be my take. I th broad, even broadening the, the, the question a little bit more, I, I think we're entering a really complicated time. Um, you know, our, our view it, as a society is now global, um, aided and abetted by multi um, uh, areas of media. Um, uh, during the World Cup in South Africa, you know, it was interesting to me to look into the stands and to see a fan of the Netherlands who had his face painted and he was um, blue and uh, blue and orange, um, and he was wearing a, a a headdress. He was wearing an orange and blue headdress. So, you know, so here we have this Netherlands fan who is dressed like an Indian who shows up in South Africa. Um, we've gone global. Um, <laughs> No, oh. so right, right. Um, you know, um, but and so I think I think that's the challenge in terms of coming to grip grips with what you know the 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 casual stereotyping that becomes such a part of cultural currency. Um, that's part of what we're trying to deal with here. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, one of the things that I would question is the notion of progress, and I think it has been questioned by a lot of people because it also, um, it, it's comparable to the question, to the idea that there's savages and um, what's next, barbarians and, and the civilized who have this destiny, you know, that we're going to somehow rise to some better place. I, I think we need to sort of just teach people these things and not worry about that, oh, how far have we come? Now Obama's in office, how far have we come? Well, we're still people and we still have the same problems we've always had. So it's really not a matter of when are we gonna get there and all be in the rainbow uh, or not, um, but that it is a, a, an everyday um, challenge to talk about these things that, you know, if they go away, that's great, but that we're gonna reach some you know, place where we're more ahead of the people that were behind us is maybe a myth too. Another question? Um, Dr. King, you were talking about the universities and the mascots and how a lot of universities have made progress in changing those. Um, but I think that, you know, one issue that we need to focus on is uh, K through 12 education. Um, for instance, um, I attended a school in Fremont, the deaf uh, school in Fremont in California, and we had a statue on campus that showed a bear and an Indian having a, a, a fight. And of course, these are negative images that we don't want to uh, keep portraying in our society, but of course, children are seeing these people who are impressionable. Um, of course, this has an impact on on young Indian children, as you were talking about, and that perpetuates those stereotypes. So my question is, how can we um, start to focus on K through 12 and perhaps make those some of those changes at an earlier age? Um, I think that I, I would agree that pro sports and college athletics get a lot of the attention because that's where the money is, but probably you're correct that K through 12 is um, where we need to be directing a lot of our energies. Um, and I would argue, moreover, that we need to be directing our energies to popular forms of education, such as the media. Um, Disney, for example, was brought up. Um, a lot of students have a sort of unwritten curriculum that they bring with them into the classroom already um, that then gets built upon with in this, this kind of miseducation that Ellen spoke about before. Um, so I think you're exactly right, and I think that those are some have been some of the hardest and most impressive struggles over the last 45 or 50 years is at the K through 12 level. Uh, another question? Yeah, I'll try to make this one short. Uh, I got a lot of things going on in my head. Uh, First, to give a little bit of background, I'm Peruvian. My father's of Quechua descent, and my mother's uh, Bostonian, actually from Squanum, right next to Quincy. 
so I'm, I'm aware of both relationships. I grew up the only sibling in my family that actually looked like a white American. So most Native Americans here look actually like my family. So growing up, I, I was on the opposite side of the crone because I grew up in Peru with everybody always walking up to me and asking me for a dollar or calling me gringo. <laughs> so, um, so I always had to prove that I was, so I was based. So this is where my interest came when I came to the States. Now looking at as a little bit from the outside in, because the Native American experience here is a little bit different than the Native Americans experience in Latin America. But one thing that I noticed from the get-go here was that there was a very much a me against them situation between whites and minorities. And the problem as uh, Mr. Jackson presented was unless you engage the majority, lots of these problems are not gonna get solved. And lots of times when I see these types of discussions, we see like-minded people, including the white people in the population, discussing the same things over and over, but there isn't some way of attacking the grassroots, the lowest common denominator. The average person isn't that smart. <laughs> so when you're trying to engage them, you have to talk in levels that make sense to them. So my question is, how do you fill in the vacuum once you remove certain things from them. Because for example, when we say, okay, well we don't want you to have a Native American mascot, but we have Viking mascots. We have other mascots from other tribes in the world that are warriors and stuff like that. But we never explain it in terms of, okay, let's look at the difference. While you might have a Viking here, you also have the media constantly showing that there are white doctors, white lawyers, white, all these other things. So <coughs> a, a icon cannot, can be a warrior or, or, or primitive in, in, or, or whatever you wanna call it and not be negative if you've got that positive reinforcement on the other side. Because if we just take away the, the, the icon, that's not really the problem because if not everybody would think that white people are Vikings. Well, some people do, you know. <laughs> That, that, that they're all warriors trying to kill everybody. But, that's, but you have to have that positive reinforcement. The other thing that, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer too, so one of my concerns is lots of times the shotgun approach of trying to shoot every single thing that we see as bad, which in certain ways is bad, you know, but every single Native American icon off the board. And the problem is, while that would be ideally the best thing to do, a, how do we achieve that if, for example, when it goes to the Supreme Court, they use things like, okay, uh, the fighting ally, uh, Sioux or something is, is bad. Well, then they argue, well, then let's compare it to the Vikings. But that makes it so that we can't remove stuff like the, the Redskins. We don't have the, the pale faces. We don't have the slant eyes because those are racial terms, not just uh, a, a, a job like the Braves or something like that, you know, because you can't have warrior things. So what I'm saying is, how do you attack this by also engaging the majority? And when we're saying, let's take these icons out, what are you gonna do to fill in the vacuum? Because when you're trying to address this, you are trying to reach the local animal, the guy who's the beer belly, bigger than mine, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and he's there doing the tomahawk and stuff. You have to fill that vacuum of, because he does, he's watching his football game, and he's trying to think of, oh yeah, how tough we are and let's chug some beers and uh, we need some icon that says that we're tough. So as, as an intellectual, we can discuss all of, all of why these things are wrong. But we also have to discuss what are we gonna do to fill the vacuum if we're telling them that they've gotta remove them. I'll take a little bit of a shot at that one. Um, I, in a previous life, I was a director of athletics, and I'm, I'm always interested in the way these conversations go um, relative to um, facilities, to the cost of replacement of uniforms, and so forth. 
because athletic folk, if nothing else, really like new uniforms. <laughs> they like to have things repainted. Um, you know, so it's so interesting to me, you know, because, you know, in any other circumstance, they would be lining up saying, you know, me, yeah. You know, so, so it is interesting that, uh, that, that we get into this. But, but, but I, I, all kidding aside, though, I think that that is um, a place within the athletic community where you can go and where you can dem demonstrably show um, in terms of marketing that by changing the look of uniforms, by changing colors, um, that, um, that there's actually a financial gain rather than a loss when you do that. So I think in terms of filling that vacuum once you get rid of a certain image, from a business perspective, there are all kinds of reasons why it might actually represent a gain rather than a loss. And I think that information could be shared in a way that um, might help the corporate people move farther down the path of, do path of doing this more quickly. Um, I think educationally, we have a couple of things going on. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of Barbara Munson. Um, Barbara's been working for years and years in terms of working with um, K through 12 um, uh, schools and children um, in, in dealing with these issues. And there's a whole curriculum that she has to help fill that gap. Um, I, I think we have two other ways that we can do this. I think we fill the gap with a legitimate American Indian um, curriculum, um, an appropriate curriculum for schools, um, and, then, um, and then we just talk through um, the fact that, um, that there are, you know, uh, teams can be named all kinds of things. Um, so I'll just end it there. Quick. Another question? Just a little addict to it. Uh, the other thing that I've, again, coming from the, from the Latino side, uh, when, whenever I go to a powwow or I uh, have traveled in the West and I've met Native Americans, American Indians, the thing that's blatantly obvious is that when I see faces like Navajo, uh, they're the same faces of what 90% of us call Latino. And when we're trying to engage the majority, well, one of the majority populations of this country is Native American. The only thing is we've basically eliminated the identity of the Spanish-speaking Latin American population. One, because in, in the early times, the Chicano population in the US, which was predominantly of European descent, but they did have some Native American ancestry too, uh, during the Jim Crow era, and it actually is uh, one of the uh, predecessors of Brown versus Board of Education, they actually litigated in California to be classified as white. Well, what's happened now is that you have people of obvious Native American ancestry, obvious African descent, that are classified as white. And they do not identify it and no overtures has been done to identify this mestizo population because Native American populations are pretty much mestizo too. Yeah, but how, how could we engage that majority to make it into a larger issue? Question? Um, yes, uh, I am a senior at Washington Lee High School and I'm in a social anthropology class and we've been discussing this a lot, oh sorry, um, we've been discussing this issue a lot and we were talking about the Irish stereotypes of the fighting Irish and um, the Boston Celtics, and the previous man was talking a little bit about this um, and how they're different um, than the, Ameri uh, the American Indian mascots. Can you explain why and does that mean that these mascots are still not racist? Can you tell me first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they're the Boston Celtics mascot is a leprechaun, which can be considered racist. So he was talking previously about how there are symbols of successful Irish men. Um, don't you think that we should spread this issue to all races, not just American Indian mascots? Well, leprechauns don't really exist. I know they don't. I know and, they don't, and, and but... I, I don't mean to, I'm not teasing you, I'm, I'm just trying to be clear that we understand one another. I, I'm with you. I think it should cross boundaries and ethnicities and groups. But 
when that debate is brought forward, which it is, not just in your classroom, but other places, leprechauns don't exist. They're not, they're not part of this debate. They are part of the debate, but not this debate. Now, uh, I'll pass it. I don't want to dominate there. I guess I will. But they exist with hobbits and Lord of the Rings and... It, could, could, you, could you go to the mic so that... Um, uh, Actually, there's I, a I, lot I of know. people waiting in line here, too, okay. and I'm so, supposed to ask our online so, questions at least once. Uh, so. Next question, and then uh, we'll okay. pick up the gentleman that, that was speaking. Yeah. Okay, I want to acknowledge all the online questions that are coming in right now. And one of them asks, couldn't school mascots be covered by Title IX education equality rules? Just repeat that again, please. Couldn't school mascots be covered by Title IX education equality rules? Ellen, I think this is yes, right Ellen. up your alley. <laughs> Things seem to be pointing in my direction. Um, you know, I've been a little bit surprised that there hasn't been more consideration of how Title IX <coughs> might apply from the standpoint that the vast majority of these mascots are gendered, the, the, um, their male representations. Um, and um, I think it is possible that, um, uh, that, that, that we could think through a way that Title IX might apply to these. Um, so I, I think it's a great question, and I think we need to have more work done in terms of explaining why Title IX would work, but um, especially given the fact that, that the imagery is so male-dominated, um, that, that would be an opening for a Title IX consideration. We, we only have time for a few more questions. Uh, uh, we're getting close to lunchtime, and then we're going to reconvene at 1.30, so please come back at 1.30, but let's take, take a couple more questions. We have all been exposed to the images of uh, American Indians as savages, one specifically of the scalping of homesteaders as they went uh, west. And my question is to the panel, can someone explain the origin of scalping to this audience? and how this became a part of uh, the, the American culture? I can talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a, there's, well, one of our, um, Suzanne Harjo today, I wish she could talk about this because this is something she's very interested in. Um, can you talk about it? Is she even here? Um, there's a, Scalping isn't uh, a, a Native American practice per se. It was um, done in the early colonial period by whites um, who got bounties for their scalps. And in fact, um, the, the man who started the Carlisle Indian School, Richard Henry Pratt, I found an, an article that he wrote addressing this. I believe it was written before 1900, um, talking about um, the different prices paid for um, scalps of Indian males, scalps of children, scalps of women. So kind of like how they used to have bounties for wolves, you know, to get rid of wolves, and they did the same thing for Indians. So the scalping, you know, it becomes, I'm not a, a war aficionado, but I know that... Um, Scalping that then becomes, it's the same thing we've been talking about here all day, is that this is the wall, what is it, the, the, the expression that you were, the, uh, yeah, the curtain that sort of goes down over colonialism that reflects back, um, doesn't reflect back what has ha actually happened in reality. And um, I think one broader thing I just wanted to say here is that the, the whole notion today of political correctness really kind of envelops this whole conversation we're having because I think people are, there are a lot of people who are intolerant of the notion of political correctness, so that's just anything that's politically 
correct, they fight. I know I even posted on my Facebook page a picture of Lone Star Dietz in his Indian regalia during some conversation people were having about not wearing um, Indian costumes at Halloween because I have a lot of historian friends who are really against that. And somebody wrote back to me, what, is this not, not okay now? You know, and thinking that it was a real uh, Indian dressed up in his you know, native costume. And, and so it's just, um, these things are so circular, but how this symbol of scalping gets attached to Indians is, is really complicated. And, and not true completely. We'll have one more question. And, um, uh, and Dr. King here just sent me a note that um, I know there are a couple of high school kids here that, are, that want to ask some questions. He's more than willing to talk to you about this uh, as soon as we, we take this last question. And, a break for lunch, and I think some of the panelists will also will stay. We'll we'll have a discussion, and we'd be happy to talk to you some more. So one last question, please. Great. Um, I want to send everybody to lunch with a call and a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was I was in really inspired by this image and by the symposium, um, and I put a piece. My name is Daisy Birch. I put a piece. Uh, I'm a poet too, on the meetup group, um, and I just want to read these five lines, and I want to call other you guys say, um, what's next? A lot of people are saying, what's next? And a lot of people say, so what? And I say, so what's next? This, this inspires a lot of people, and it makes people laugh, and it makes them think. And I want a lot of people to bring up things, whether it's a question that can be transferred like good gossip, or a piece like this, or a poem, um, that, that makes people laugh and cringe at the same time and ask the question so it spreads like good gossip, whether it's in this little city or in the country or worldwide. So I can just read these few lines uh, that I wrote because of the symposium. I dedicated it to the symposium. Go skins. A phrase can reflect what some don't detect, but what wrenches us all to the bone. We're all playing with fire when one's dish of desire is served up on ceremonial stone. There's been a request, not for the few, but the rest, that a new phrase would best serve us all. But more ancient is finer if it's just a one-liner. Go pigskins is befitting football. <laughs> I'm going to put it into a song, because I'm changing poetry song, and I invite people to just do this. Create it, put it on t-shirts, put it out, spread it out, because this is just a few of the people that made it here today, and so many people wanted to come. You know it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me just say in closing that uh, I, I appreciate uh, your attendance and your attentiveness, and uh, thank you to the panelists as well. And um, a, a word of uh, encouragement, uh, Please uh, uh, talk to each other, uh, listen to each other, uh, talk to your children, uh, talk to your grandchildren, talk to your great-grandchildren, <laughs> and, um, and let's see what kind of different world we can create. Thank you very much.